So I had these two parts. When I met Mandy at the door, she asked me what it was all about. And I didn't know whether I was excited or sceptical. I think we all want to play, close, play our cards close to our chest, don't we? And I was really mixed up. I, I said, you know, she said, what's it all about? I said, well, selling soap to your relatives, you know. <laughs> I wasn't taken in, you know. I knew what it was. It's selling soap to your relatives. And she said, she said, oh, well, we don't want to do that. And then I realized, then I realized I put her off. And I thought, well, you know, we might want to do it. So I said, well, maybe we do. <laughs> you see, I wasn't sure. Anyway. As time went by, I began to think about it. The magnitude of what I'd seen began to sink in. And whilst remaining cautious, okay, I got excited. And my excitement built. And I did some research, I listened to the tapes, and I read the books, and I read that business of your own, and I started putting the names of my friends in those circles and work out what it would mean. As time passed, I became more and more positive. And when Ronnie called again, I decided that I was going to give this business a try. I suppose deep down inside, I really wanted to believe it was true. I think that's important. I think everyone who gets in the business really wants to believe it's true. Okay. I really wanted to do something with my life. I wanted to achieve something great in my lifetime. I didn't want to live for 70 years and die unnoticed. I didn't want to live a life like a trial run. Get it right next time. There wasn't going to be a next time. I had one chance. And maybe this was my chance to do something great. Maybe this was my chance. I sometimes think about what would happen. There was those two sides to my personality. What would have happened if that wary, scared, skeptical side of my personality had dominated? Probably not that much. Probably not that much would have happened. I've yet to meet a happy coward or a successful skeptic. Okay, I'm glad today that I had the courage to, to follow my convictions. Anyway, two days later, Ronnie called. Jerry, this is Ronnie. How are you doing? Great. Listen, Jerry, uh, Bill O'Brien's coming to New York. Great. Well, you remember Bill O'Brien. He's really successful in the business. Uh, he's an Emerald Direct Distributor. He's making a lot of money. And he wants to meet you. I'll pick you up at 7 o'clock so you can meet him. Now, I was impressed. I was impressed how fast this communication network was, was moving. I mean, within a few hours, it got up this line of sponsors and distributors that this sharp, brilliant entrepreneur had seen the business. And I was impressed that Bill O'Brien would find time to sit down with me personally. I mean, I got the distinct impression I was going to tell him what I was going to do with the business. I got a rude shock. His idea of me meeting Bill O'Brien was to take me to an open meeting. Okay, now, he picked me up at seven as promised, and he took me home, and he sat down and he ate his supper. Now, I hadn't eaten. He assumed I'd eaten, and I didn't tell me any difference. I was too shy, right? And I sat there watching him, my stomach gave... <laughs> and I was starved to death. I watched him eat his supper, mouthful by mouthful. And he said, great. Wiped his mouth, said, let's go. He was going to pick up another English couple. That was his month. I mean, he found someone. Okay, it's scary, but he had had about 12 no's before us. He nearly didn't call us. But, he, you know, he'd found someone who was, who was going to go for it. And this, this one was English, so obviously the thing is sponsor English people. Have you ever done that? You know, you, you, you go three, three months out sponsoring someone and you find a teacher. You think, aha, it's teachers I've got to go for. <laughs> well, he thought this and he went, aha, English people I've got to go for. And he'd actually contacted the wife of this partnership. And well, she was working as a waitress in a diner. He was a, a financial executive with a Barclays Bank. And he was working on placement in New, in New York. And uh, we picked up this couple. Now, he primed me up. I wasn't allowed to tell them anything. Kind of difficult, isn't it? You're spending half an hour or something. You can't speak to them. And uh, I wasn't allowed to tell him anything because he didn't want me to blow it. Okay, because I knew what it was all about. So we spent half an hour going along in this car, talking about everything under the sun. The weather, yeah, football, yeah. Everything we, you know, where he came from in England, that kind of thing. And then after about half an hour, this guy, the guy of the couple was getting really wary. He didn't know what it was all about. And he started firing some pretty close to the mark questions to Ronnie and Ronnie was sort of like fending them off as best he could and mercifully around about 8 o'clock we arrived at the hall where this open meeting was to be held and Ronnie got out of the car and uh, he sort of raced ahead to meet all the contacts he already knew and uh, that left me behind with this couple, I was following behind with this couple and I've always had been a little bit of a, a cheeky person and I remember walking alongside this couple just thinking hey now wouldn't this be a laugh I put my hand on the guy's shoulder and I said, Hey, John, tell me, 
what do you know about the Moonies anyway? <laughs> and this guy, you should have seen him. You should have seen him. He shot back. He shot back into the car at about 100 miles an hour and sort of like wedged himself in. <laughs> so, he couldn't, so he couldn't get out. And there was Ronnie there for about 10 minutes, coaxed him in. Well, eventually he got him in. <laughs> eventually he got him into this hall, right? And... Um, it was like one of our open meetings. There was the people in nice, neat rows, you know, about, about 12 rows of seats and people all sitting neatly waiting for the speaker to arrive. Okay, things don't change, you see. <laughs> and uh, they were waiting for the speaker to arrive and uh, we took our places round about the middle row. Okay, and uh, I was one of those people you dread taking to an open meeting. You know, those ones, you know, within 30 seconds you knew it was a mistake. Okay, well, thanks, Mike, appreciate that. Well, I was one of those people. Okay, I, can't, I couldn't see Ronnie. He actually sat, me behi- uh, sat behind me, but today I can see him. I can imagine him cringing as single-handedly I set about destroying the meeting. Okay, there was a speaker. It wasn't Bill O'Brien. It was one of the, one of the other emeralds in the organization over there, and the speaker was doing his best. He was doing a good plan, but all the way through, we, I was sniggering. I was elbowing this couple, and I was, you know, going through all, all of this number of and you see, everyone else was glaring at us. I, I always love a bit of attention. <laughs> everyone was glaring at us, and we were whispering. And, you know, I was being very critical. I mean, my, my biggest c- uh, criticism was it was really American. I don't know what else I expected in America. French, you know, I suppose. <laughs> but, yeah, oh, it's so American. And, of course, it was materialistic. And it was this, and it was that, and this was wrong with that, was wrong with it. The guy was cross-eyed. I didn't like the way he walked up and down. Everything you could possibly imagine was wrong. Okay, and, uh, you know, everyone else was getting really hostile with us, and I thought, this is good fun. And um, after about half an hour, the guy of the couple turned around to me. He said, Jerry, he said, this is a bore. He said, look, Let's go and have a beer, okay? And I thought about it, and I said, no. Now, at that stage, I had a split-second decision to make. It was going to affect, I didn't realize at the time, of course, but it was going to affect our our lifestyle dramatically either way I went. And I decided, no, no, I wouldn't go, I'd stay. But they went anyway, they went went up. Have you ever had that in a meeting? People walk out, sort of like tends to ruin the flow of the meeting, everyone was looking at them. I decided to stay. I just wasn't that rude, I suppose. And... uh, when they actually left and I had no one to whisper to, I actually had a chance to listen to what the speaker was saying. And when I listened to what he was saying, I got really excited. And by the end of the evening, I was, I was well into it. I was excited. Now, what would have happened if I'd have left the room? Certainly there'd be a few fewer people in the room today. But if I'd left that room that night, I know what would have happened. would have sat down, would have had a beer, between the three of us, myself and that couple, would have ripped the business to pieces, would have analyzed it, would have proved it wrong. Makes me think, how many good people miss out on their one big chance in life, their one real opportunity in life, because of the influence of some mediocre mind, some individual who's got all the answers but has never actually done anything? Scary, isn't it? In that split second, I make a decision to follow the people in the business to follow the Jaegers, to follow the Hart Isis, to follow the O'Briens. Today we're following their footsteps. We're a few steps behind them. Okay. The exciting thing for you is you're on the same road. The only difference between you and them is the time they've been on the road. Okay, that's what excites me. But what would happen if I'd followed them? Well, in five years' time, I probably would have what they have now. What have they got five years later? It's five years since we saw it. It's five years since they saw it. We decided to do it. They decided not to. Where are they five years later? Probably the only difference between them then and them now is they're five years older. That's probably the only real change that's taken place in their lifetime. It's amazing. Our dreams are very fragile. They're very easily destroyed by people who've given up on their own dreams. Okay, we had to build a resistance to the influence of people that had never done or would never do anything. Because, you see, all they'd ever do is make us focus on what couldn't be done, why we couldn't do it, why it wouldn't work. Okay. I never understood this. I never understood why people would do that until someone in the business said to me, Jerry, what you've got to understand is that everybody wants you to get ahead, but not ahead of them. Those that aren't moving ahead themselves aren't going to encourage other people. 
Instead of encouraging others to achieve, they hold them back. It's a conspiracy of failure. Isn't that true? Everywhere you go, underachievers holding other people back. Anyway, at the end of the meeting, I had my chance to meet Bill O'Brien. <laughs> I haven't explained. I was there in my jeans, right? <laughs> really impressive businessman. I was there. And I went up to Bill O'Brien, and uh, I thought I'd impress him. I thought I'd impress him by telling him I thought it would work. <laughs> okay. No, you understand, here's an emerald, okay? He was making, in one day, what we were making in a month, working full-time, and I told him I thought it would work. Okay, I'll tell you something. Bill was not impressed. <laughs> <sighs> Stupid idiot, honestly. But I told him I thought it would work. And he went, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, who is this idiot? <laughs> uh, but after that, we went to diner. And I remember, this is my chance I really got to know him. You know, a lot of the people cleared out the hall, but like, as always, the committed ones stayed. And, uh, you know, I, I stayed behind. And, you know, I remember sitting till late at night in this diner and uh, having a coffee. In fact, having several coffees. In fact, that's one thing you do with your Bill Brian, you have lots of coffees. And uh, we sat in this diner, we drank coffees, and he started explaining where the business was going. Where the people who took this business seriously were going to be headed. And I got excited. And I wasn't just excited, I was really excited. And that's the night when I first really began to believe that this thing was real and that we could do it. In fact, that's night, uh, that night I made a commitment. We weren't going to try this business anymore because try is nothing. Try doesn't mean anything. We're going to do it. Okay, we're going to make it happen. And I went back to Mandy at 1 o'clock in the morning all excited. I shook her. She, <laughs> she was asleep. I said, I looked her in the eyes, my eyes blazing with excitement. I said, it's, no, not that. <laughs> I said, I said, you're a naughty bunch of people here, shouldn't you? It's not like that. I looked at her and I said, it's true. It's true. We've got to be rich. And Manny so went, oh, good grief. That was two people that night I hadn't impressed. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Mandy now, and she's going to explain basically her reactions to the business and our early story from uh, when she was no longer comatose. So I'll hand you over to Mandy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you've heard from Jerry, you know, I really wasn't involved in the beginning of our business. I wasn't invited to see the plan. And all I knew was that it was something to do with me selling products to our relatives. So I had a very distorted view of the business from the beginning. And I quickly told Jerry that I had no intention of selling anything to anyone. And I just dismissed the whole idea from my mind and I just assumed he'd do the same. And really, we just didn't talk about the business at all from then on. And uh, in the next couple of weeks, you know, Jerry went to a couple more meetings. And once, when he came back from one, he said to me, let's sit down and write a list of our goals. And I said, don't be so ridiculous. We know what we want. We don't need to write it down. And, but he insisted. He said, no, no. He said, they, they tell us we must be specific. We must write them down. So we sat down at the kitchen table and he got a piece of paper and he wrote down points 1 to 10. And within two minutes I'd filled those up. So he wrote down 10 to 20 and I carried on talking. And he was writing figures down by the side of each of the goals. And finally when he'd added all these figures up, you know, he, he was really quiet and he sort of sat back in a state of shock. And he said, oh, I think I'm going to have to be a diamond. Well, I said, I said, what's a diamond? You know, what on earth is a diamond? Um, so that, at that stage, he got out the pamphlet, The Business of Your Own, and tried to explain the circles to me. Now, maths has never been my strong subject. I hated it at school. And as soon as I saw the figures, my mind just closed off. So try as he might, he just couldn't make me understand. And he got really annoyed, and finally he just slammed the business of your own down and said, it's no good, you're just going to have to come to a meeting. Well, I didn't want to go to a meeting, 
especially a business meeting, because, you know, at that time, I was very, very shy, and I hated mixing with people. I never went to parties. I just avoided all those situations. And one of the worst things for me was to have to walk into a room full of people. And I suppose I was just frightened of people. I didn't know what to say to them. So, uh, you know, on the day that we were supposed to go to this meeting, I planned it so that I would catch the late bus home from work, hoping that he'd already left and that I wouldn't have to go. But that didn't happen. I got back and he was waiting for me. And off we went to a meeting. It was an open meeting, just like the ones we have over here now, every month. And, you know, as soon as we walked in, I just wanted to die. I just wanted the floor to open up and for me to be swallowed up, because everybody there was smartly dressed. You know, they were all in, the men were in their grey suits and their red ties, and the ladies were wearing suits as well. Now, I knew it was a business meeting, so I didn't know what, you know, I should have expected, but you see, we were in jeans. We were both in jeans. We didn't own anything but jeans in those days. But I was annoyed with Jerry because he hadn't, he hadn't warned me, he hadn't told me what to wear. He hadn't even noticed, <laughs> probably, what people wore. Didn't bother him at all. But I just, oh, you know, I just, that was the worst thing. And also, ev everyone seemed chatting, and everybody else seemed to know everyone else apart from us. And although Jerry had met some people before, he couldn't remember any of their names, so he didn't introduce me to any, anybody. So we just stood there. And I was just so relieved to finally sit down amongst the crowd and, and hide, ready for the business presentation. And fortunately, our upline diamond below Brian was explaining the plan that night. And, you know, had he just gone through the circles and gone through the, the figures, I'd have been totally bored because I still didn't understand those circles. But, of course, he didn't. He talked about the need to have ambition and the need to have a dream. And he wrote that word dream up across the board, right at the top of the board. And underneath, he uh, listed about five to six things that he suggested we may want out of life. Now, I wanted them all. <laughs> you know, I wanted them all and more. And as he talked, I got more and more excited. Um, and it seemed, I suppose, up to this point, that we had been looking for something. Maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, we were looking for something. That's probably why we were in New York, New York trying a business. You know, and as he talked and he, he continued to explain the business, I thought, well, maybe this is it. Maybe this is it. M maybe this is what we've been looking for. So that night, we both went home excited, and we sat up to the early hours writing out our goals and drawing up a prospect list and listening to the tapes that they'd given us. And uh, we decided, you know, to build the business. Now, I suppose we could have used a lot of excuses at that stage because we really didn't know anybody. We had kept ourselves very much to ourselves during the six months we were in New York. Uh, we didn't have any transport, and we certainly didn't have any money. But we decided to do the best we could with what we had. And so we, the follow-up was done, the start-up was done, and some meetings were booked for us. And after a fair amount of procrastination, Jerry finally picked up the telephone and invited the people. And he invited six people, and four people came to that meeting. And that first night, we sponsored our landlord. He lived in the flat above us, and we achieved our major objective because he had a car. And so he was going to drive us to the meetings from then on. So whether he wanted to go or not, that was irrelevant. He was going. He was our wheels. And I suppose it's a good policy to, to follow, you know, what you don't have, sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, you know, our American sponsor treated us well from the very beginning. He supplied us with books and tapes. He would call in, find excuses to call in, and leave us new books and, and tapes. And I got into the reading um, fairly early on because I used to travel to my nanning job. I used to have to take a 40-minute bus ride there and back. So it was I had plenty of reading time. Now, and I never used to look forward to this journey because it went through a really rough neighborhood. 
In fact, it started in a rough neighbourhood and Jerry would have to walk me to the bus stop because it wasn't safe to go on my own. And uh, most of the passengers were school kids, they were school children. And every day, these five strapping lads would get on the bus and each of them would have a ghetto blaster balanced on their shoulder, each tuned into a different station. You know, there's great competition going on. And then they'd light up and they'd pass a joint around and wake themselves up by smoking pot. So, you know, here was a country bumpkin sitting on the, the bus and this journey was quite a different experience to my uh, bus rides that I used to take when I went to school. So it was ideal reading time. You know, I just bury myself in, in the books. And the first book I read, I'll always remember it, it was The Magic of Thinking Big. And that book... God, I just saw myself so many times in that book. You know, I buried myself in it, and once I started, I couldn't put it down. And if you haven't start, started reading yet, I advise you to do so, because all I can say is that the books that this business has made, made available to me, that's one of the greatest benefits to me, because the books have built my confidence, they've helped me to stop worrying, and they've just generally helped me to become a far happier person.